call him my brother. I followed him around when I first met him. I kind of wanted to touch him. <laughs> John uh, lived in, in the 70s, he lived in Northern California. There was a small oil spill there. It upset him so much, he decided, I'm not taking any motorized transport anymore. I'm just going to walk. He said he did that for about a week or so, but his friends and family people would just get mad at him because they'd be like, just get in the truck already. And he'd be like, no, I'm not getting in the truck. So he decided he was going to stop talking. John walked across the country for 22 years, um, the US and Latin America, to raise awareness about the environment. He did it 17 years without talking. He got his doctorate at the University of Wisconsin in environmental studies without talking. Any y'all in school? I know I could never go without talking. I could barely go without for five minutes with my whole PhD. Yes, he did it without talking. When John started talking again, but he was still only walking, he was working on a friend's boat in New England. When Exxon Valdez happened, he was the only PhD in the country who had done a dissertation on oil spills. So of course DC called him up and said, please come down and interview for this job. And that's a sort of a long story about how he couldn't fly down, he couldn't take the train, he couldn't take the car. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, I will ride my bike, it'll take about a month. They said, okay, we'll wait. He eventually got the job and became one of the architects of our oil spills. <laughs> he runs an organization called Planet Walk. He wrote a book called Planet Walker. It's really wonderful. Um, there's kind of an interesting story how National Geographic didn't want to support it, of course, and now they're supporting it. Hollywood had brought the rights to his story. And people always ask, me, they said, oh, but Hollywood will mess it up. I said, listen, when was the last time you've seen a movie about a black man who walked across the United States for 22 years, 17 years without talking to raise awareness about the environment? Hands, hands, hands. <laughs> I don't care who's doing it. It's a story that needs to be seen. Think of all the people that will come in and watch it and be like, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. <laughs> I know, I know. Got to tell one more story. I'm skip all these. <laughs> What did you say? What was that? Your stories are better than our questions. No, no, but you are kind, but I'm, so, okay, yeah. So this is in the last chapter, and there's a couple more stories I want to tell about this. And one of the things that was really interesting to me as I was writing this, and because I had to do it with an academic press, and I tried to write it, I had to write it somewhat academically, but I also wanted to write it accessible for anyone to be able to read it. It was really my goal to try to do that. And when I would talk to a lot of scholars, particularly white scholars, or journalists, the question I got most often is, so black people are afraid, right? They're afraid of the outdoors. Why don't you talk more about that fear? You're afraid. I'm, so, I'm exaggerating a little bit, but not all that much. <laughs> and you know, it just started to irk me, because yes, I've told some stories about the fear, but you're not hearing what it is I'm trying to tell you. We are not defined by our fear. If we were, we would not be here today. Let's be really clear about that, right? So I want to talk about our resilience, our resistance. So I usually read a passage at this point, which I'm not going to do because it's just why we are afraid. Because then I get emotional and then it's like messed up. So <laughs> instead, I want to tell you a couple more stories, and then I'll sort of open it for questions about people who are have incredible ideas. Uh, earlier, you saw me flash back. There was a picture of the cover of Vanity Fair magazine. They did their first green issue, I believe it was in 2006. On the cover of the magazine, you had Al Gore, Julia Roberts, one of the Kennedys, and George Clooney. In there, there were 63 pages about people and organizations doing amazing work about the environment. And I take nothing away from anybody in that magazine. There was about two people of color. One of them was Mongari Mathai, the Kenyan woman who had recently won the Nobel Peace Prize. And I said, man, if I'm just part of the general public, you think black people don't, first of all, don't have anything to say about the environment, don't do anything with the environment, have nothing to offer about the environment. And it really just upset me, because once again, this, that perpetuates this myth that somehow we can only be dealt with as victims or people who need to be outreached to, that maybe you need to sit down with us and say, we got some good ideas. You know why? Because we're just like everybody else. And also, we've had to fight particularly hard to be resistant and think outside the box in order for people to think about us differently and be who we are fully in this place. And one of those amazing people that I met a few years ago is Brenda Palms Barber. Brenda Palms Barber is um, originally from Denver. She had gotten her degree in business, and she was asked to come to Chicago because a lot of previously incarcerated black men and women would come out of jail and couldn't get a job. And so people said, please come help us figure out what can we do, what kind of work can we get these folks. So she said she came there, she was thinking about all kinds of things, maybe they can do landscaping, maybe they can drive around the elderly. None of these things seem to be long term or have anything that would really build roots within the community. And then she was talking to a friend who said, start talking about beekeeping. And she said, that's a good idea. We're going to get them to make urban honey. And some people thought she was kind of crazy. <laughs> We're talking about the west side of Chicago, right? Well, her company is Sweet Beginnings. It makes honey and honey-related products. It's so popular 
and so successful she doesn't know what to do. She would tell me how she kind of created a, a, an organization in between called U-Turn, this idea that anyone can make a U-Turn in their lives. So one of her approach to this was, again, now I don't like the word outreach, I don't use it anymore, because for me that defines a sort of one directional relationship, this idea I have something to give to you, but you have nothing to give to me. Right. Instead of it being re re reciprocal and the idea that we both change in the process of building that relationship. So she started by, she said she would interview maybe a young man and she'd say, hi, how you doing? What's your name? You tell him. She said, so you were in jail. And they'd be like, yeah. So what were you in jail for? Usually she said they'd say, selling drugs. And she'd pause, you know, a dramatic pause. Were you good at it? <laughs> <laughs> Often they'd say yes. And then she said, well, what were you good at? Well, I knew the, um, I knew the value of my product. I knew, I knew about the quality of my product. I understood my customer base. And everything she said they listed off that they knew, she said, that's transferable. Now we're going to transfer it to urban honey making. <laughs> what she did know after doing this for a year that she was actually running a green business. She had no idea. She did not come at this from, I am doing this to be environmentally friendly or green, because she didn't feed her bee sugar derivatives. Everything she did was just by really intuition and instinct. This idea that it was local, so things that people would think were weeds in the west side of Chicago actually produce quality honey. The idea that the people involved there weren't only feeling valuable in and of themselves, but this is also something about memory and black culture, this idea of sharing skills like beekeeping, something black people have done along with a lot of other people for a very long time, and now they're quite successful. I love that. This is really out of the box thinking. Okay, I know, I know, one more, one more. <laughs> Can I tell you about Pearl? Do you guys know Pearl Fryer, a man named Pearl? Oh yeah, man, a man named Pearl. Okay, we're gonna skip it. No, I don't want to. Okay, I can go back, okay, I can go back. <laughs> okay, then I have to stop because I'm asking questions. Man named Pearl. Uh, so Pearl Fryer, he now lives in, I believe it's Lumberton, South Carolina. Did I get it right, Yvonne? North, North Carolina, thank you. Uh, Pearl, uh, there's a documentary called The Man Named Pearl, so you can uh, get that about him. Pearl talks about how he and his wife, a few years back, uh, moved into North Carolina. They were kind of retiring. It was kind of a nice suburb, and it was a white neighborhood. And he had heard about a garden contest, you know, who wins for best garden. But he also heard that, you know, black people don't win because white people think that black people don't keep their yards nice. And he was like, I I'm going to show you that. <laughs> so he said he had no skills or background in this, though I think he clearly had the talent. So he went down to the local plant store. They had thrown out a lot of trees and old plants in the back they weren't using. He asked the guy, can I have these? Can you tell me something about them? The guy did. He'd take them back, and he created these kind of topiary. Now, do you know the kind of commitment <laughs> to this that you got to have? Because sometimes it takes years to grow these things. Now people come from all over the world. Kids come from all over the world. There's a local community college there that he goes in to teach an art class. And he talks about where you could see love, peace, and goodwill for him. It's really his way of changing the way people think about him, his wife, other black folks, each other, how we think about each other, how we think about trees that we throw away, people that we throw away, land that we throw away. And this is the kind of commitment that he turns it around and get emotional every time. OK, so I'm not going to say any more, except that I want to come back to my parents. I just wanted to end on that note. And then. Um, so in 2000, in the late 90s, Mr. Tishman, and I always say, you know, I, in fact, I still call him Mr. Tishman as a whole psychology thing. If we had some wine, I could really break it down for you. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Mr. Tishman had died in the late 60s, and Mrs. Tishman was quite ill in the 90s. And my, she and my father were really very close, and this is a bone of contention with my mother, and it's all, it's got some driving Miss Daisy in there, and my mom would be sad, but it's true. He was by her, her, her bedside when she died. And she, he is who she wanted by his, her bedside. She also had grown kids. So she was thinking, what's going to happen to my parents, right? Either she's going to die, are they going to be able to stay on this land? And to her credit, she actually wanted to see if she could keep them on this land in the gardener's cottage. Um, the property taxes at that time, late 90s, over $125,000 a year. My father made about $20,000 a year. She was willing to pay for it in perpetuity. Her grown kids weren't having any of it. It wasn't going to happen for multiple reasons. So at the end of the day, my parents decided they were going to move um, to Leesburg, Virginia, where my youngest brother was living at the time. She had a house built for them, 
on a half an acre of land that's there. So my parents moved there in about 2002, 2003 full time. There was now a family from Latin America in the gardener's cottage, which is also quite interesting, caring for the property. Um, and my father has, my father has been depressed the whole time, more, even more so than I think my mother. My father has been depressed about leaving that land. Uh, probably around 2003, 2004, one of the neighbors sent them a letter. It had come from a conservation trust, the Westchester Conservation Trust, and sent them a letter saying, you should know that this is what's happening to the property. And the new owner, who I've met, who lives on the property now, is having a conservation easement placed on the property, which means that in perpetuity, there can be nothing really essentially changed about that property, no new structures built on that property over time. Uh, and he was, they, the letter talked about all the, the reasons why this was an important piece of property, all the different kinds of wildlife, the deer, the, the turkey, the wild turkey, the waterfowl, the egrets, the snapping turtles, the different types of trees.